it's 9.15, that's our scheduled time to start. Um, what I'd like to do this morning on paid leave is hear from mostly the administration and joint fiscal on issues they have with the House passed bill that assuming we were to go in that direction, what kind of cleanup they might like to see in any of the sections. Uh, I'm not really interested in hearing their overall objections and theory to the bill or its breadth or lack of breadth, but just corrections they might want to see or difficulties they may have in their roles and improvements that they would like to see in the bill. So Cameron, can we start with you? Yes, sir. Thank you. And I assume you're, you can speak on behalf of the department? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Welcome back to this committee room. Yeah, long time. Not only this year, but for past years. Yes, sir. I, uh, it's, always a, it's always a pleasure to be over here. Uh, for the record, uh, Cameron Wood, I'm the Unemployment Insurance Division Director with the uh, Vermont Department of Labor. Um, Mr. Chair, just so you know, I did have a conversation with Damien on Monday. We spoke, uh, myself, uh, Jess uh, Vintner, um and Damien for about an hour, a little over an hour, and just talked about some of the technical uh, you know, issues that I saw with the bill that may need to be fleshed out. I'm happy to kind of walk through those with you. Um, you you guys mentioned work on any wording at all? Um, you know, I don't know if it's for me particular wording. I don't necessarily have a problem with uh, how it's specifically phrased. They're more of just um, you know highlights that I think um, you, the committee, need to be aware of, and I'm happy to walk through them. But it's mainly with uh, some information sharing questions that came up. Um, you know, I don't think there was anything. You know, from a grammatical or, or a drafting standpoint, that I had a, had an issue with. Can you start off perhaps by describing the sixty-four thousand view the Department of Labor's role in this bill as passed? Yes, sir. Um, so. You stated uh, just a minute ago, so I'm not going to go into the administration's position. I think the committee is fully aware of that. Um, as it's drafted in this bill, uh, the department would work with the departments of tax and the Department of Financial Regulation to uh, issue an RFI and then issue an RFP uh, seeking uh, proposals from an insurance carrier to provide uh, the benefits that are listed in the subchapter. Um, that was one of the concerns I had with Damien was to make sure that the language is drafted such that, um, you know, do we need some of this language in here if the insurance carrier is going to presumably be the one doing the work? And he said he had drafted it in such a way that, you know, like the benefits. Uh, administering the benefits, it's not um, directed at a specific agency, it's just this shall be done. So if it's done by an insurance carrier, that language is fine, I don't have a problem with it. Um, so we would work with those two departments, do an RFI, do an RFP, um, from our perspective, presumably find an insurance carrier who would be able to carry out the provisions of this um, this bill, I think that's what everybody's hope is because we do have concerns if, if it were to uh, default back to labor. Um, presuming that it's done by a third party, the only thing that the department has to do in this bill is we would hear the appeals coming from that third party. Um, so an individual who was you know, aggrieved by a decision, maybe they were denied benefits, uh, or if an employer had a, had a, an issue with a decision made, um, the, I guess it would be the second level of appeal would come to the department to one of our administrative law judges. And then the security board? Uh, yes, sir. It would then go to, the, the language in the bill is drafted such that it would follow the sections within unemployment insurance. So it would come to us. What about contribution rates? The employer had, the employee had an issue with the contribution rate. 
Uh, I will defer the Department of Taxes on that because the Department of Taxes collects the contribution. My understanding is it's supposed to be treated in the same way other withholdings are collected. So I presume, presumption on my part, that there's an appeal process there for that. Uh, so for us labor, it is just managing those appeals. And as I mentioned last week, I think, you know, one of our positions is, you know, we do feel that is something that could be carried out by a third party. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe you asked, you know, well, who would be the ultimate decision maker? I think you could still have that being the Supreme Court or a court of jurisdiction in the state. That's not to say I think the final decision should lie with them. But um, in looking at, you know, um, the I believe it was in the RFI that was submitted when this was put out by the administration, the a third party insurance carrier's ability to effectively administer appeals um, was pretty successful in the eyes of the administration, both on their timeliness and in their record of accuracy. So I have this sheet here on the Department of Labor's appropriation budget. I don't know if this was this was presented to us on April 25th, uh, but it looks like this. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, it is, this is just, uh, thank you very much. This is, uh, this is, well, in the first full year, it's about a million dollars. That's just to process appeals. Uh, yes, sir. So uh, not just to process appeals. appeals. Um, as you'll see, we tried to break it out as best we could. We'd have $100,000 in there for marketing. Our, our biggest concern as we ramp up the program is making sure individuals understand if it's being administered by a third party, you know, where they need to go to apply for benefits and how the process would then work. You know, our concern is, um, you know, just making sure the public would understand how the process actually works. Uh, we have $5,400 in there for fiscal charges. Uh, I ran this by our fiscal director. This would be roughly 5% of one of his staff's time just to manage the, the program that's administered by us. Um, we had equipment, supplies, and rent there. Uh, postage, that was one thing I flagged for us internally to reflect on. I'll, I'll be honest, that is a, a best guess estimate at this time for the postage because we're just not sure you know how many appeals we would receive we spend in the unemployment insurance program we spend roughly three hundred thousand uh, dollars in postage every year granted we're doing a lot more mailing um, uh, so we just tried to look at it from a third of that and then mainly it's going to be the staff we asked for four administrative law judges one person to oversee them and then uh, one FTE for legal staff time um, that is mainly for, again, we, we're somewhat um, unsure of how many appeals we will get. So how many, how many do I claim get I believe on the claim side, we hear, I think it's between 2,700 and 3,000 appeals a year, I believe. How many ALJs do you have? We have three ALJs for unemployment insurance program. Three I'm not sure off the top of my head. So is it fair to say it looks like you get about one percent of the jobs result in um, the UI claim? Uh, well, no, we don't, we don't get oh, how many UI, how many UI claims do you get? Uh, the last uh, numbers I looked at the other week, we had um, about 16,000 open benefit years. So 16,000 people had an active benefit year currently established. So within the past you know, year, we had 16,000 people apply. That's awful high to get 3,000 ALJ. Is that 
Uh, I would want to double check. Like I said, I think it's between 2,700 and 3,000, so it could be on the lower end, but I believe that's what the number I got. The last time I looked at that was when this was an appropriation, so this was a month, month and a half ago, and so I can verify those numbers for you and get back to you. <coughs> Um, our, our concern with this, like I said, was just we, it's a little bit of we don't know. Um, and then the administrator would be a supervisor. Um, and uh, So do you know if this was passed in the House budget? I do not. The, or the FY 2020 was in the House budget, the the but not the 2021. Yeah. Okay. Well, they haven't done that. Yeah. Okay. The 217,000 was in? I believe so. Um, so you said something about um, what you saying about the, going for the RFPs. Do you were you think that some of the appeal process can be part of the RFP as well and take away some of the need for some of this money? Uh, yes, sir. I think it's the administration's position that if this were to go out to a third party, we feel that this level of appeal is something that can be handled by the insurance carrier. Right. We don't feel that it's something the department has to get involved in at that level. Um, in, you know, we were speaking to the administration last week. Um, they gave us some numbers from, I believe it was from the RFI that came in, that showed how that carrier handled appeals and it showed their, um, their accuracy rate and their timeliness rate. And um, if I'm being totally honest, I think they were, there would be better than the department could provide. Um, and the other thing we discussed was this is how uh, in you know, normal insurance realm, individuals appeal. Ultimately, I think it goes to Department of Financial Regulation to make a final decision if they appeal from a decision of an insurance carrier. But you know, we just feel like the, it, it doesn't have to be with us. We feel that's something that if it's gonna go to an insurance carrier, they would be equipped to manage, to manage that. Certainly, they feel on all other insurance products, this is a social insurance program, so I don't know exactly how it works in a health insurance situation where you appeal on others. An in-house appeal, I don't know if you have the right to go to into the Vermont court system or an appeal to the commission or the right. But I don't think for this size of benefit and the fact that they're the ones who are processing the claims, I tend to agree with you. I think to the fullest extent possible, we should keep it within the insurance product. Uh, yes, uh, what other roles do you have here besides helping with the RFP and possibly the appeals process? If, again, on the presumption that it goes to a third party, those that would be our role. Um, the, a concern we have, which I mentioned last week, you're aware of, Mr. Chair, is that if we do not find a third party, there is a much larger role for the department. We would then be administering the program. And you know, much of the information we've provided from a fiscal standpoint does not reflect that. Um, so our, our role would drastically change if that were the case. But under what's currently here, uh, if presuming we get a third party in, um, that would be our role, would be RFP, working with our uh, peer agencies to issue that, and then just handling the appeals process. And, and I believe some, some reporting, but you know, that. Okay, so let's talk about this last issue, the what if. If, if we don't get a third party administrator, I assume there's some parts of the bill that you have problems with as how it transitions the our biggest concern is um, the timing and not having fully fleshed out what that staffing model would look like. Um, I mean, when we came into the house, uh, you know, we presented it was eight to twelve million dollars a year for personnel, depending on how you wanted the program structured. 
And so I think if we, um, I'm not sure a lot of that has been fleshed out. I don't think I have a lot of um, substantive issues with what's here. Uh, I think there's just some minor details that would need to be worked out if it does revert back to the department. For example, one thing I've mentioned to uh, the House Committee was um, there's an expectation in here that we make decisions within five days. It gives us ultimately, I think it's up to 20. I'd want to verify that with the committee and the language, but you know, for us to make decisions in five days, that drastically raises our need for staffing. And so those are the types of policy decisions that you know, uh, I've referred to and Jess has referred to of trying to flesh out if it were to be a department program. So those are the main concerns I have. I mean, again, there's some technical things in here I'm happy to go into with you, uh, whether it goes with a third party or stays with us. Um, but, you know, I think as a general they're, matter. They're truly technical that I'd ask you to try and do today. And maybe tell us already with Damien. Yes, sir. Go through and have him, that he can explain it to us and if there's any changes, we can incorporate them if they make sense to us. And I did. That was the conversation we had on Monday. So I think if he if he's able to come in here and kind of walk you through some of those things, that would be beneficial. Do you have a good one second? So yeah, last, yeah. Um, no. Last year we talked a lot about the administration when it was going to be done in house, and the direction this committee went was trying to get the financial eligibility and health eligibility uh, being done by DOL and the payment of benefits being done by tax. Was, was that, in your mind, one logical way of doing it, or was there some fatal flaws that you saw in that division of labor on a, on a government run program? Um, if I'm being totally honest with the committee, you should um, always be totally honest I with the committee. Absolutely <laughs> agree. Here, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> I have concerns about having a program of this magnitude being administered by two separate departments. Um, does that mean it can? You know, I think last biennium when we were discussing this, I think where we got to a dual program was when we discussed UI eligibility, trying to use the UI program. There are some concerns with that. Um, you know, so then we kind of split it up into Department of Labor and Tax. That's one of the things I raised with Damien um, on Monday when we discussed was if um, you know, there's a presumption that in, you know, if it were a state-run program, Department of Tax collects the contributions, and then there's this fund that there are three departments pulling money out of, and it's just the financial management of how that works. Um, tax is collecting the contributions, but in the bill, Department of Labor would have to collect the overpayments, and I just see a lot of problems with that structure. Um, so. If I'm being totally honest, right. yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> I, I personally have concerns with that. I think it would be a much um, smoother administration if it was done by one department. And I'm not saying that would be Department of Labor or Tax. I'm just saying I think that if 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 it were to be a state-run program, that would be my recommendation. Um, we've seen, and I've mentioned this to Damien, another. Another concern that I have that I think the committee needs to be aware of as you move forward, um, I was mentioning this, Mr. Farnham and I have been talking about this over the past few days, uh, the definitions, I mentioned this to Damien on Monday, the Department of Labor's definition of employment and wages is different than the Department of Tax's definition of employment and wages. And so last week we had talked about monetary eligibility and where would that be decided. Uh, those are concerns that we have. Um, there is still. You have to direct them what definition of wages you want them to use. If they're yes, sir. If they're collecting a contribution as well, you know, if it's entirely with them, yes, sir. I think you would define what you want to use as employment and wages, and I don't necessarily see a problem with it there. 
Uh, I think it does potentially raise a problem if um, either a third party is administering it, but tax is collecting the contributions, and labor is making an eligibility determination. I just as you bring in, you know, different agencies with different <coughs> definitions, it becomes more problematic. So, other than that um, confusion or differences between two departments two, doing two different things and having two different definitions, putting that aside for the moment, if we wanted to make eligibility for this program exactly the same as it is for eligibility for UI, is there a complication there? I understand it would be nice if we can do that within your evolving computer system, but even if we can't, there does seem to be some advantage to me where if the house is so close to what the UI definition of eligibility is, why we have to play with that at all. You know, if, if it did come in-house, I would hope we'd get to the point where somebody could come into your place and at least on the monetary eligibility be treated exactly as any other claim for UI benefits. Right. Um, a few things on that. One, uh, I'll flag it for the committee is the eligibility piece. I think it needs to be addressed in the bill, regardless of whether you go with UI eligibility or not. Uh, I don't want to speak for the tax department, but I think both of us would struggle making a determination based on an eligibility that's described. For, we don't use monthly wage information. So when it says you have to work for six months, we can't make that determination at labor because we don't know what sure months. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your question, to try to take it in two parts. Uh, one, do I see issues with using UI as an eligibility determination? Um, presuming we, you fleshed out all the definitional issues, uh, one thing I raised for Damien was our capacity to share that information with a third party and whether or not we would be allowed. Uh, I spoke to our general counsel, Dirk Anderson, this morning. Um, we think that we can. We don't think there's a problem there, but we would feel that in order for us to share UI information with a third party to determine whether someone's eligible or not, we would need a consent signed by the individual to do so. That could be part of an application process, so I'm not trying to say that that's a huge hurdle. So do I think it's it's an option and possible? Yes, sir. I would want to make sure the details were buttoned up to do so. Uh, the second point I wanted to make was on the IT side, and I, I, again, I don't think there's a, a massive hurdle if you went down that road, but um, I think we could, I would want to have a conversation with ADS to see how we could try to fit that in if you move down that road. So I don't want to say there's not a problem there, but I don't know. And I, I would be thinking, there's probably glitches in this, but I would be thinking, if we can't get a third party, there would be something as simple to qualify for this program. You have to meet a the financial eligibility for employment insurance, and, and that's where I'm thinking about it. Just in that right. that simple, um, not rewrite the whole thing. Right. Yeah. You know that simple aspect of it. Um, again, if we had someone's consent, I think we could tell a third party, yes, this person's eligible, no, this person's not eligible. Uh, but again, with the definitions, what I would, um, you know, I don't know um, if the committee would want to go down that road. You know, Mr. Chair, I know you are aware we do not have information on all Vermonters. You know, there are large sections of employment in the state that are exempt from UI. Uh, and I don't know if you'd want them covered or not, but we would not have that information. So, so you said you're helping with the RFI and we'll help with the RFP. What generally, what's the stage of those, of that process at this point? Um, my understanding, I will probably need to defer to others in the administration. I'm not sure that um, we've on down very far of a road of drafting an RFI or an RFP. Where are we talking about? If so we were to issue an RFI or an RFP, have we, we done have any work? To not on this specific bill, just been there for the Department of Labor, for the governor's um, 
So the R, uh, the, all the RFIs in the governor's program did? I believe so, yes. And so the next step is to, to work on the RFP? Yes. And <coughs> yep. And I would defer to uh, Commissioner okay. I think you'd be here tomorrow. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I would, I would ask, this may be something we need to clarify with Damien, the way I would may want to add something in the language maybe um, that says an RFI that's been issued by the department prior to this going into effect would suffice for that section. I mean the way I I think you could I think you could read this language to say that we wouldn't be able to use that RFI we'd have to issue another RFI. There's front end and back end stuff on this that it seems like it would be in everybody's interest if the third party can do it all. But has there been any pushback on not doing either the initial eligibility or not doing the appeals process? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of, and I haven't um, been privy to all of the information that was given in the RFIs. But Commissioner Pichak would be able to answer those questions. Senator Clarkson, sorry. No, no, just to go back to the default, I'm reluctant to spend a lot of time on the, on the default until it's an issue. Given the robust response to the RFI so far from the governor, I don't anticipate our having a problem with the RFI. I, I, I think we had talked last time about pushing back that date a, a bit in case there was, and so I, I'd entertain that. But I think to invest much more in, in, in a identifying and laying out a default thing at the moment is, is not a good use of our time. I totally agree, but the date and what I don't want in this is to be to them coming back and say what you put in law is an impossibility. Right. I agree with that. We don't want any barriers that are you know put up at the last minute. Um, but I did, but a realistic date that is that is realistic uh, in case this is what we're facing is it, important and that would be and you I have this and I can't it's a random I have this October 1st 2020 here and I don't I can't remember what that's for so what, so a realistic date would be something I'd be entertained putting in this bill. As I mentioned last time we were here, um, and Senator, I appreciate the comment. That is one of the concerns that I have is, um, as we spoke last week, if we aren't able to get a viable RFP response, having some default back to the department and the time frames in which they're there, uh, because, as we spoke last week, uh, if we were to build a program from scratch, my personal recommendation would be three years out at a minimum of being able to... To build it and go on, go live. Yes, ma'am. So, but uh, I think to have a program designed, is that the October 1st, 20? If, if, if we get no, if we do not have successful RFP, RFIs and RFPs, I believe, was that what we and Damien, I may defer to you, does the program go into effect October of 2020? That's when benefits go online, and right. April 1, 2020 is when right. contributions are supposed to begin being collected, um, and that's the same regardless of whether there's a third-party insurance carrier or the department uh, and the state are, are standing up the program on their own. And so we're talking at the moment about, I said, I, didn't, I don't want to spend a lot of time designing a default position to, to, to push out and make a realistic date by which if there were no successful RFI responses or RFP responses, what is a realistic date for, uh, the, for the department to uh, design a system and have it ready to go? Sure. Are you looking for input from me on that? Or I, I think Cameron was. Yeah. 
So I, I, what I can say is, is that in the states that don't have a TDI program pre-existing, right. the timeline is typically uh, 18 months to two years for collections to start, and then two and a half years to three years for benefits to start. Um, but to design, I mean, how long? Yeah, so that, that would, you know, so that's, that includes the doing all the rule adoptions, doing the internal administrative design, setting up a collection system, and then also, um, you know, I, I think if we were moving to the state operating the program, uh, there would need to be statutory changes, and this would give time for those to occur right. probably next session. So um, two years to design and build and three years for it to be online. Right, because you need to build up reserves and so forth. Um, but yeah, two years to get to the point where you're able to collect contributions and have things going. I think what we've seen with other states that are building it from scratch, uh, like with Washington State, right. for example, they're getting their collection system online first and then finalizing the other pieces as time goes on. Um, so they're not necessarily having everything online at that date when collections start, but they're, they're staggering things. So they focus on making sure that they've got a tax collection system that works off, right off the bat, and then getting the other pieces in place and finishing up uh, program design around benefits appeals and eligibility determinations and so forth. Have the RFIs been made public? Yes, those are all public. I'll send Kayla the links. They're all on the uh, Ways and Means website. Uh, so what we ask Cameron to do, it sounds like he's have, maybe have done this already or have mostly done it, is to get with you on technical changes he saw necessary in the House pass bill, and then you could put them in yellow and discuss, explain them to us and we'll decide whether they're necessary or not. And we'll probably do that with the other witnesses today, just for your edification or knowledge. Um, I'm just going through the administration and JFO witnesses right now to see where they have issues with the language of 107 has passed the House and whether they would like to see any, is there a need for changes not necessarily on the merits of the program or the direction of the program, but if we were to pass uh, the basic concept of 107, where would they see improvements, like to see improvements that affect their department? So with that, I'd like to ask Doug if you would come on. So, sorry, can on? I just have one more issue that you raised, that you would like to true up the definitions. We have a whole definition section, as you yes, pointed out. Um, and it sounds like one enduring thing we need to fix is up the definitions between tax and DOL. And can't we do that here in this in definition section? Uh, yes, ma'am. One that I Wages flagged. Wages an employer or an employee. And, and this is one that I think will just be an ongoing flag. And this is what I mentioned to Damien on Monday was it just depends on how the bill shapes itself coming out of the committee. We need to make sure whatever definitions we're using will reflect what the program is expected to look like. Uh, I do have some concerns with some of the definitions that are there now. Well, let's face it, if we're, if we're not sure, sure enough, So the, they need to make. Again, it is mainly dependent upon um, who is administering the collections and how that interfaces with the eligibility. So what? So, for example, the definition of employer in this bill is different than the definition of employer for UI. The definition of wages is different than the definition for UI. So, if you're using these definitions and trying to use UI as an eligibility, you're going to have different people paying into the program than who may be eligible for the program. And how do we determine who's eligible for the program based on a different set of wages used? That's what I'm trying to flag for the so committee. So we're going to have to decide if we want to balance your original comment that you don't want to spend too much time designing the default position back to the 
state government. Right. So my under so those definitions only need to be trued up if we end up in a default position. Well, they okay. don't even then need to necessarily be trued up. Okay. It's just going to make their job harder. Right. If we don't trude them. Got it. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Having me, Mr. Chair. Same drill. Start out wherever you'd like. Uh, first, why don't you give us the, again, the 60,000 overview of the role that the department has in the HR service as the house? So for the record, Doug Farnham, um, Policy Director and Economist for the Department of Taxes. Uh, the role of the Department of Taxes in H107 as it passed the house is to um, either participate in an RFP process that finds a third party agent to collect the contributions that would fund the, uh, the special fund for paid family leave, um, or failing that, to, to take over collection of those contributions under the, um, the wage withholding definitions used for income tax used by the IRS for those income tax purposes. Um, so I think th the element of, so beyond collection, the element that is kind of read into the language, it's not explicit in the language, but it would be a necessity, is that tax would be the one with the data of who's been contributing and how much. And in order to determine eligibility based on the six month and wage requirements, so uh, we believe that we would by default be responsible for that verification that someone has contributed an appropriate amount or the third party uh, insurance agent that the tax kind of contracts would perform that service would be responsible for it. So you would be responsible. If we get the third party administrator they may be able to do all that yes but it also may be we get a third party administrator and the decision is made that you do that part of their work in terms of financial eligibility they may say we'll do this process except we won't do the financial eligibility that would fall on you that is that clear in the statute or could it fall on the department of labor um under the current language i, I it actually one issue is that it's not explicit who it falls on um, so it's not called it's not specifically called out who determines that initial eligibility and it could create some confusion between the Department of Labor and tax about you know whose job is this actually to do this um, and it's something we'd have to work out possibly there is a provision for an M a memorandum of understanding so the departments could work it out in there but it's not good for long-term stability to have that significant of a decision um, kind of agreed upon in an internal document like a memorandum. Uh, so I think that that is, in this version of the bill, if the tax department were to take it over, we estimated about five FTEs to collect the contributions. And that would include handling the appeals. Uh, we see a lower appeals volume on contributions like like wage withholding uh, we see a much higher appeal rate and and burden on the benefit side but tax is not involved in that so um, on a resource level there's a definite and explainable disparity between the amount of resources tax would need to handle the contribution appeals and what labor or an insurance agent would need to expend to handle the benefit appeals um, and we see that in our renter rebate program our property tax adjustment claim program appeals are much more frequent and much more onerous in those areas where someone has something to gain the contribution is a flat rate 
and it likely wouldn't have um, a high amount of appeal overhead. And that's kind of baked into the current structure. Okay, but Sorry. I guess as opposed to appeals, which might be carved out, even if we had a third party administrator, right. I think the collection of contributions uh, and the payment of benefits is at the core of what a third party administrator would do. Would you yes. Like to see them say, I want to do certain parts of the program, but I don't want to write the check for benefits. Right. Okay. Yeah, that, that would be very unlikely that an RFP response that had the third party agent doing parts of it, but not all of it, would be acceptable to the department. Right. Because we currently do not have the information to determine if someone has worked for six months right. or if they've earned the appropriate amount of wages. So all of that would need to be generated through the collection process. Or, so states that have these programs do it two different ways. About half of them collect all of the information up front. So every piece of data that you would need for every employee in the state comes in on either a monthly or quarterly basis. And then it's available for when a determination needs to be made. About half the states do it that way. Um, Before you go on. Yeah, sorry. Is there any information that sounds like labor doesn't collect the information on all the people who want to reach here, but is there any piece of information that you get presently that comes close to providing information on the same people that we can add on to the form and get information for this program? Um, presently, not really. We do an annual wage reconciliation, and that's all we that's all we do at the department for tax purposes is an annual reconciliation of wages for every employee. What about the claims assessment? Is that done quarterly? Because the claims assessment, the healthcare right. healthcare claims, yeah. um, that's based on an FTE count, not necessarily a head count. So. You could have two three-quarter time employees that are 1.5 FTE, and so it's not necessarily by the actual body. Um, and you don't get names in that context at all. No. You would need names in this context, right? We would in this con. We would either need to collect the names up front, or well, it's actually yeah. you get it in terms of people filing the claim. You know, as long as the employer collects the information based upon the number of employees they have, not FTEs, right. but employees, then you don't need the name information at that point. Right. You have a fund, and then people draw the fund. In about half the states just have require an employer certification that that, that employee has worked there for six months and has met the, met the minimum qualifications. The main difference there is that that places a bit more burden on the business at the time of claim, and it makes some of the timelines for, for a benefit determination extremely difficult to meet, because then you'd involve yet another party in you know, the successful evaluation of a claim. I hear that, but how, in that context, does the, do you know that the employer's been paying in the right amount of contributions? <laughs> In that context, um, we would likely still need to collect, or the third party would need to collect, kind of employee by employee gross amounts. And as long as those gross amounts matched up with what the employer certified that um, at the time of a, a claim, it, it would be difficult to get around collecting the detail um, on the employee level. But that's one reason we're still looking at what other states are doing. Um, in, in trying to determine if there's a reason they, they really collect all this detail up front and some of them don't. Let's go back to Senator Clark's point again. We can get really down a rabbit hole yes. and try to construct the easiest program possible if the RFP fails. Um, I guess we'll just have to make that decision pretty soon because I guess what we don't want to see happen is the RFP failing and then be stuck with a five-year wait. Or yeah, something. right. So, exactly. Well, it, it'll be. We know it would be three years. Anyway, I mean that Washington isn't able to do it any faster, and they have more resources. Yeah, they're they're doing a, a really 
complete bells <laughs> and whistles program. Um, bells and whistles soup tonight. Okay. Uh, anything else? Do you need to have a conversation with Damien similar to the one Cameron had in terms of technicalities? And yes, there are a couple um, technical changes I could recommend. Um, that I can speak with Damien about that shouldn't change the, the policy outcomes that are only in the nature of just making some of these elements a bit clearer. Um, but the difficulty there is that those technical changes all hinge on tax being the default for collection. Uh, so if, but I, I would assume that you could just discard any changes I suggest if, if that were to change. Right. Uh, I mean, it, 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 if there are things that are make sense to put in this bill, even though we're all hopeful that there won't be a default to state government to do collections, uh, and it would help move that process along in case it does fall upon you, uh, we could certainly entertain those suggestions. Okay. I think unless you have something else to add, I think I would try. I would hope you can connect with Damien sometime before tomorrow morning when we're taking this bill up again. Right. Uh, the only thing I would add, um, kind of echoing Mr. Wood's comments about definitions, but from the other angle, if the definitions were to be aligned with the unemployment insurance definitions, but then tax were to be the default party responsible for collection. Our current resource estimate is based on being able to cross train some of our internal staff and leverage our understanding of what income tax wage withholding. We have no experience with unemployment definitions. We have, so we think our resource estimate would be low if the definitions were changed to unemployment insurance definitions and tax were to be the one administering it. Um, and I think that in my opinion, it wouldn't be possible to align the wage withholding definitions with the unemployment insurance definitions. It's just not something we have the liberty to do in Vermont, I believe, um, because they're, they're just two bigger structures that exist federally and we don't really have control over those things. Um, so it's an unfortunate, unfortunate reality. Um, and I'm not certain how much our resource need would go up above the five. Um, I don't think the use of either definition would affect the third party costs. So the ironic part there is that if it were changed to UI and tax were still the default responsible, it would make us more likely to accept an RFP response because the odds that it would be more efficient than, than our ability to do it internally would, would go up. Um, Any other questions? Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Joyce. How are you doing over there, Cheryl? <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> We're just spinning. I know, I'm just spinning. Good. A lot of stuff. Yeah. Morning, Joyce. Good morning. Okay, so um, in addition to the standard question, uh, I know we've identified a couple of issues already. Um, we may, we might want to start with the question of uh, cash flow. How does that sound to you? Sounds very good. Thank you. Uh, for the record, I'm Joyce Manchester with the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, oh, you forgot. I put it. Sorry. copies. Maybe you have another room with Lance's copy. Sure. So let me hand this around. I'm going to be talking. Oh, I should just hand the lunch. So, Kelly, you have your own now. Yeah. I want to start with page one. Okay. So page one at the top. Okay, so, so let me first say that the bill, according to my reading, states very clearly that the Department of Texas shall collect contributions. Yes. So I am assuming that the Department of Texas will collect contributions and pass them on to the special fund and payments to the insurance company, if an insurance company is found, will be made from the special fund. That's the way the bill is set up now, that's I believe. Big, that's a big difference. 
So I was reading section 574, is it, of the bill? 573, 574, yeah. and then the section clear. setting up the special, the special fund itself. Okay. okay. So. so. So what I'm assuming is that. Before you yes? go further, just, was that your understanding as well, Doug? So my understanding is that it's our responsibility and that we are able to contract for it. Yes, so the third party could collect it. Yeah, there is the option for the contracting option. with the, the third party insurance carrier to do the collection or to administer that. So that, that is an option okay. that was okay. put in actually in the house because of concerns that tax had about whether they could get that employment data. Um, and right, so it's on page 10. Yeah, so that was added in because the insurance carrier, if they were doing the collections, might be able to structure it in such a way that they got the employment data they needed to do an <coughs> eligibility determination. And now one more question. What about the quarterly collection? Would that still be in place if the insurance carrier were collecting? It's still set up as a quarterly collection. Quarterly collection, okay. All right, fine. Okay, um, good. Okay, so. Uh, we in JFO had some concerns about the cash flow because, as you recall, the contribution rate starts at 0.1% of wages up to the Social Security maximum. That starts on April 1st, 2020, goes for six months at that rate. And then on October 1st, the payments, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the benefit payments can be made. So people can start drawing benefit payments and the contribution rate goes up to 0.55%, okay? Now, in my old spreadsheet by fiscal year, I was just sort of ignoring the timing of, of how those payments would come in, and I was, I was assuming that I was looking at a fiscal year, I knew the, the rate and the wage base and so forth, and I was just moving through the fiscal years. So, in my new world of thinking about the actual months of how things come in, um, I am realizing that a quarterly payment for April through April, May, June, three months, uh, would actually come in on July 25th, according to the way that quarterly payments come into the state. So that means that we're almost at the end of the month following the end of the quarter, right? So this means that once we get to October and we have to make those monthly premium payments, which are quite large, six million plus, um, we have to make those monthly, presumably, to the insurance carrier. There would be October, well, let's see, there's, a pro, there's an advance premium payment, we think, uh, depending on the contract, but it's likely that there would be an advance premium payment made in September, let's say. So we've got September, October, November, December, and maybe also January if the premium payment is made first of the month. Um, and there would be no big contribution received, that higher contribution rate applied to the wage base, that big lump would not be received until January 25th. So, so why, if you have a theory or maybe name you could, why did the house go with this two-tier two -tier. approach? So it was, it was trying to keep the rate down as long as possible and thinking that for the first six months we were only paying rather minimal administrative costs. So we're setting up the Department of, Labor, Department of Labor and Department of Taxes to be able to run the program. Oh, so they were planning to have cash in the bank to pay the person once We were thinking we could borrow in anticipation of receipts, da da da, yeah. So it was- yeah, That's still a possibility, no one's disputed that, right? Oh, we, we can borrow. The question is how much are we borrowing and is it a problem for the state treasurer's office to borrow as much as we might need to. Right. So um, over the weekend I spent some quality time with my monthly uh, <laughs> spreadsheets and on Monday we met with the treasurer's office. And the bottom line is that under the current timing of the bill as passed by the House, there would be a month there would be months in which we have to borrow $26 million, which is a sizable sum for the treasurer's office. Uh, they maintain a balance, a reserve, against which many different needs can borrow. Um, 
their problem is that if that balance drops below, let's say, 100 million, they have to pay a higher rate to borrow. So they would prefer not to drop below, and that means they would like to keep the borrowing at a moderate level. So at the present time, uh, they're looking at a balance of something like $117 million, I believe, and so a $26 million draw would drop them below that, that threshold and they'd have to pay the higher rate. So they, it, it, and also, uh, it might affect the CAFR, the, the state uh, statement of financial, whatever. <laughs> what does CAFR audit report. Exactly, thank you. Uh, he has a little experience. <laughs> so, so that would not be a good thing for the state to have it. So could we dispense with the two tiers? If we went with 0.55, could we do 0.55 starting somewhere in the summer and for these minimal administrative costs, borrowing, anticipating of payments? I mean, I, well, I mean it seems to me yeah, it's a not an like this, why, why, right. why send a signal to the business community pay one rate right. in the middle of the year and then in the middle of the year again you're changing mm -hmm. the rate? It's just going to breed confusion. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, way back when, I had modeled starting at 0.55 from the beginning, and the problem there is that then you accumulate many millions in the fund. So it's just a matter of, of how you want to arrange things. What, what I've shown here on the first page is the way that the bill is currently set up. So I'm showing you, uh, we can go through these numbers if you wish, or you can just have them in your back pocket if you wish. But um, under this scenario, there is a a $26 million deficit in some months, which gradually gets paid off over time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking that 10 to 12 years out, we would we would have paid down that, that monthly debt that then drops and then comes back again and then drops and comes back again. Um, if you're interested, I can also hand out a second page, which looks very much like this page, except that I've moved the 0.55% contribution rate to start in July. So I've just moved it up by three months. And then the, the rate with the highest borrowing is um, about $10 million. And that would be much more tolerable mm -hmm. for the state treasurer's office. So that would be a That a, gets a rid fix. of the point 0.1 altogether? So the point 0.1 would start in April. And you may not want to do the two tier again. But the point 0.1, according to my little exercise, starts in April for three months and then jumps to point 0.55 in July. And your new suggestion would have? 0.55 starting in July. 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 Right now it starts in October. Okay. So if we did that and got rid of the 0.1, what, oh. would, what would we do? So I haven't tried that yet. She hasn't done I haven't actually run she it through the monthly one. numbers, but I'm, I'm suspecting that we would have a lot of millions of dollars sitting in the special fund. I'm, I'm, change, I'm not changing the 0.55 to April. I'm just suggesting you get rid of the, the point one altogether. Oh, 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 I see. Um, so we Sounds would. Sounds like it would be manageable. Uh, probably. The, probably. The treasurer's um, I'm not sure I can. So. so you could you run the numbers with point five five starting on. Sure. April, April, 1st. April 25th, and also on July 25th. Okay. And then nothing else. Just okay. Those two. Okay, so if I look, uh, should I hand out my second sure. spreadsheet? So the first quarterly payment is about 3.6 million. There's three going that way. Two going this way. This is page two of the So are we starting with page two, just to see what that looks like? <laughs> so page two uh, it, uh, pushes up the contribution rate to 0.55% in July of 2020, and it should say page two at the top. Okay, so the little box, the smallish box at the top left is still the fiscal year, uh, you know, benefit payments, contributions received, and so forth. 
And then you should move to the right where it says Part B, monthly cash flow for the treasurer's office. And that shows you the monthly um, total cost, total revenue, cash position by month, and assets and liabilities at the end of the month. So you can see the first revenue from payroll contributions occurs now in August of 2020, that's FY21, quarter one, pink line. Uh, so that's the 3.56 million. So that's 0.1% on the wage base for the first quarter of the program. Starts in April, right? But it's not received until August. Okay, so if we took that away, we'd have some negative asset liabilities, line 12, um, for the first six months, but they wouldn't be terribly big. They so, would be. So, Joyce, why, if that's collected in April, is it only showing up in August? I guess I'm not understanding. Right, so, so it's specified in the bill that the wage contributions are collected quarterly. Right, I got that. So, but April. That's... April, May, June, and then they have to pay, then the employers have to pay the tax department the quarterly payment. And oh, currently, so the payment doesn't yeah. start in April. I thought the payment was starting in April. Well, it would be withdrawn first. from my paycheck and, and the employers would have to come up with the funds if the employers are paying, right? So they could start withdrawing. At the end of that quarter. No. No, they could start April 1st. The contributions are in effect starting April 1st, but they are not due at the tax department. They are not paid, remitted to oh, the tax department. I so after the quarter. Remitted starting. You don't, but no. the pillar has the house, just to be clear. They don't ask for contributions to be paid until January of 2020, until January of 2020, January 25th. The first contributions you're going to receive in cash from the employer. Is that correct? Uh, April, <coughs> April 1. Starting that quarter. And then paid on a quarterly basis. So April, April 1. April 1, 2020. It got that, bumped out three months. Is that the 1% or is that the point? The point 0.1%. Okay. So I don't know that we would need to go through it now, but I would like to see that contribution. Uh, the April, May, June contribution that's paid in July be 5.5%. Right, uh, 0. 0.55. 0. 0.55. Yes, and yes, I can do that. that. See how that results. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Okay, so, so just uh, to orient you a little bit, um, so this, this is the exercise that says what if we increase the 0.55 in July of 2020. And so you can see that that payment is about $20 million. I'm on the bottom left of the page. You can see the $20 million yep. collected in, or remitted November. to the tax department in November. So that shows that the maximum borrowing in this, in this case would be about 10.86 million. You can see that at the bottom line 12 under October. So before that first big payment comes in, you've got the maximum borrowing. Okay, well this seems a, a fixable problem. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So I, I'm happy to run those other two scenarios and it won't take long. So. Okay. Um, what was the second problem you thought we needed to look at? Uh, well, there was the issue of do you want to rely on the Vermont livable wage right. as being a, a you know a real key part of this bill. So what is the difference between two and a half times the Vermont livable wage and the average weekly wage today? <laughs> right. So um, did I pass out this document previously to the committee? Pass it out again. So I'm sorry, I don't have it, but Taylor oh, could make it. Can make a copy? Please. I, I don't have it electronically. Can you make a copy of this page? It's the average weekly wage. You passed it out before, right? 
I thought I did. I don't have it by now. We might have it in our folders. You might. I, I have it dated date is it? March 25th. But I don't know if that's when I put it together or when I presented it in committee. So, can we talk? Yes, okay. We so, right now, the uh, Vermont livable wage is thirteen thirty-four per hour. And remember that the Vermont livable wage is determined by the Joint Fiscal Office based on statute, and it represents the cost for a person living in a shared household, two adults in a shared household, to pay uh, their share of, of what we say is basic needs for that household. Okay? So it's 1334 per hour. That changes every two years. And one, one issue is that it changes with methodology because we're constantly trying to come up with a better way of measuring the basic needs budget. Thank you. So there is a question about whether you want to use this sort of construct that could change quite, um, you know, not because of economic reasons, but because of methodological reasons every two years. Or would you prefer to use uh, uh, a figure that is determined statewide, the average weekly wage is something that's reported by the Federal Department of Labor for Vermont. It looks at all wages in Vermont, uh, changes annually based on the economy and who's working and so forth. Um, but it's a much more reliable, steady, growing uh, measure. So, okay, so the Vermont living wage, livable wage, is 1334 currently. Um, 2.5 times that is 69,368. You can see that across the top there. Page. Uh, the Vermont living wage, uh, I'm sorry, I want to go to the um, average weekly wage. So if you go to the middle of the page, there's a block there that shows you 60% of the Vermont average weekly wage is 1409, 55% is 1291. So pick where you'd like to be, but we could get pretty close to that same average um, hourly wage. Right. Um, so you can see, let's see. So if we chose 55% of the Vermont average weekly wage, uh, we would be at 67,153 on an annual basis. So that's pretty close. Well. Personally, 2.5 times. I much prefer the average weekly wage. There's reasons I don't like the livable wage to begin with, but we do use the weekly wage for workers' comp. Yes. And I think, Cameron, what's the maximum benefit you can get in UI right now? The maximum benefit amount in UI is 498. And well, as a percentage. That must be 50%, maybe? Yeah. For the average weekly wage. That, that's just a number of statute, or is there a multiplier there? there there's, a, there's a formula. In the yeah, statute. I believe it goes up by the increase in the average weekly wage. Yeah, it was tied to it with an original amount, and then we right. now we're on a what's it yeah. annual indexing. Yeah. yeah. So if it started around fifty percent of the average weekly wage, and we're then indexed to the change in the average weekly wage, it would still be at about fifty percent of the average. Yeah, there right. were a bunch of statutory changes in there. It was frozen. And oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, sure. right. it's it's out of the frozen stage at this point, right, Cameron? Damien, what did it just index to? Not the current statute from me. Um, yeah. So when we went to Schedule Three, Mr. Chair, you brought this up last year. When we went to Schedule Three, I think it indexed to. Fifty-seven percent sticks to the Title Twenty-One. Yeah, it's over here. Yeah, I'm pulling it up. Okay. <laughs> so, does and and I know work is comp is tied to the average weekly wage. You're saying the average weekly wage in Vermont is determined by the feds and not by the state. So it gets reported to the State Department of Labor. It's it's uh, wage data that okay. are collected by the feds. 
or maybe through the stage of the beds and back to the state. Not sure. So Jack, we know 57% is a key number in unemployment law. You're correct. That is the current multiplier. That's what it indexed. So that, that's what it indexed to after the schedule. I think, that would, come, I think that would come out almost identical to what the House passed in two and a half times. Uh, we can talk about the number uh, a little bit later, but do people generally agree that an average weekly wage in Vermont is more appropriate than the livable wage, which is a creature of politics and statute? Well, and it's also not the livable <laughs> wage that's for one person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just remind me what else is indexed, uh, uses the average weekly wage, UI and what workers else? Workers' And workers' comp, both of them. Yeah. UI and workers' comp. I know that UI does. I'm Th I know that workers' comp does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Workers' comp is 66%. Uh, That's I think yeah, so. Get, I'll double check that. Yeah, you get two thirds of your You get two thirds wage, of your regular. But I think the maximum is also two thirds of the average weekly wage. No, it's, no, it's not, it's 150% of the average weekly wage, actually. Is, is what work is yep. The other thing that I can flag on this page is that um, Vermont's maximum weekly benefit is quite a bit more generous than in other states. So if you look at, um, let's see. The Vermont livable wage, 2.5 times, you get a maximum benefit of 1,334 under current under H107 as passed by the House. Right. And I've shown you at the bottom there are some maximum weekly benefits in other states. So New York is at 984, Washington State is at 1,000, Massachusetts is at 850. So we are quite quite a bit above um, those other states. I think part of the reason for moving that high was to be closer to the, the governor's proposal. Their, their maximum benefit is 60% of the Social Security tax max, which is 1,533. So that's a really high uh, maximum benefit. So you could drop that maximum benefit. Say what the governor's was again. 1533. It's in the middle. It's right here in the middle. Oh, so secure. It's it. Yeah. And why did they, given that we've been talking about all these other things, why did they choose to go to the Social Security? Is that so they went with the Social Security tax max because it's a number that's out there that, that people are familiar with. And you'll recall that the wage base now in H107 as passed by the House is also up to the Social Security tax max. So that, that measure is already in the bill. <laughs> so is this the governor's proposal by having the high maximum, does this mean that everybody gets as a benefit, uh, like there's no contributions over a certain level where it's That's not right. being rewarded with a higher benefit? That's right. So your wages are taxed up to the Social Security tax max right. if you earn that much. And your benefit would be um, calculated against your wages up to that amount as well. And do you know the choices that other states, I think we have probably the chart here, we have some mistake, but what other states have done for a taxable wage base? Uh, Really variable. Yeah. yeah, it's on that big chart. Has it's anybody gone higher than 132? Uh, last year, last year it was up 150. Yeah, so the taxable wage base uh, in California it's 118,371. In New Jersey it's only 34,400. In Rhode Island it's the first 69,300. In New York there is no uh, taxable wage base that they limit, but they have a different system because they use private insurance carriers. 
Um, so there is a cap on what you can charge for disability benefits, um, but otherwise it's determined by your carrier's premiums. Uh, the, um, let's see, Washington State and Washington DC and Massachusetts, I don't see a taxable wage max for them, but let me just double check. Um, no cap for Massachusetts that I'm aware of. Uh, sorry, I'm checking footnotes here. Um, and no cap for Washington or Washington, D.C. that I'm aware of. Um, so they, they may be without a cap. And then Vermont is at 132. So if the states with a cap that we know of, we have the highest cap on the wage base. So is there a way of structuring this where by we can increase, I'm not going to be very articulate, say increase the taxable wage base and at the same time for those people who are affected by that increase in the taxable wage base, they would get slightly more benefits of being rewarded for their contribution, like the government tried to do. Um, so you're saying you'd like to, well. well I, I assume, let's put it another way. I assume that the House Pass version has, at 132,000, and with their benefit levels, there are some people <laughs> in the group that are claiming benefits that will get the same maximum benefit as they make 132 or 150 or whatever, and somebody makes 100, and they're still getting the, the both maxed out. I believe it was 117,000 was the salary at which you get the maximum benefit, but you are paying taxes up to 100. And I, I think this year's taxable maximum for Social Security is 138,900. Uh, so you'll be paying taxes above the level at which your benefits max out. Do you get the sense that in terms of the workforce, that if we raised the contribution rate and raised the maximum benefit for people who had higher contributions, um, that we would be able to lower the <coughs> rate of contribution for everybody else? So. Uh, one thing to realize is that the the amount of wages above 138,000 or above 150,000 gets pretty thin. That's what I'm asking. Right. So uh, raising it it's by a lot okay, would you. make a small difference, but not a big difference. Okay. Raising it by a little bit is not not going to make a difference. That was my question. Yeah. Okay. So we have to um, we have to. Do on where we want to go with the maximum benefit level and possibly the contribution rate. Um, wage base. The, no, right, the taxable wage, wage, wage base. base right. So we have taxable wage, wage base to land on. We have ma ta maximum benefit. Yes. Yes. And we, what's our third thing we have to make? Well, I think we've already decided we want to change it to the average weekly average. wage. Yeah. Uh, and and that, 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 that's where we have to determine the percentage. And it's probably going to be somewhere between 55 and 60 percent, I guess, of the average weekly wage. And comparable. To yeah, that. and I can update this chart because these. This average weekly wage was released, I believe, in April of 2018. So if I look again at the website, I may get an up-to-date. Yeah, it's a whole, whole year later. later. Yeah. Can you uh, price out 57% given sure. that the UI is at? 66%. That's of workers' the, comp. So workers' comp is 66% of the employee's average oh. weekly wage, oh, oh, oh. but not higher than his or her max or minimum. So if you were going to set a cap, tied to an employee who's earning the average weekly wage. You could say 66% of the state average weekly wage, or you could do the UI, which is 57%.
and then you'd have the same cap benefit. Sure. So, I guess my concern on the benefit, the, the max benefit is that is still a low, that's household income, right, we're talking about. That's a person's income. It's individual at whatever, where, anyway. Okay, that's better. Yeah, I mean, one of the issues that has come up on the House Pass version is the fact that was in yesterday's news that 60,000 people maybe have worked at so sporadic that they might still have to contribute to the program but not be able to qualify for benefits. Um, can you? Where, where, where was that from? 60,000. Is, is that what you understand? I don't know where that number came from. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'd, I'd, like, yeah. I'd like to find because we knew it was a percent. Okay, but Cameron raising his hand. Go ahead. Uh, so we actually did some investigation into this um, using labor's wage record information. We looked at calendar year 2018. And we found uh, it was 101,000, 104,000 Social Security numbers that made less than what the qualification is in the current bill, uh, which I think is uh, minimum wage, half a year's worth of minimum wage. So we found 101, 104,000 Social Security numbers that made less than that in our wage record. We then tried to look at it and see um, because the other qualifying criteria was that you work in six months. And as we said, we don't have monthly data, but we tried to limit that to people who had wages in at least two quarters. And we came up with, I think it was 60, 69, 69,000 social security numbers that had wages in two quarters that did not meet the monetary threshold that's currently in the bill. So those, could, those people could be overlapping, right? They could be the same. Uh, no, sir. These would be individual Social Security numbers. Different than the uh, hundred one thousand. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Those two would be overlapping. Yes, the sixty-nine thousand would be a subset of the hundred and four. Okay. Yes, sir. It's also true that the twelve-month period is a rolling twelve-month period in the bill. I believe. I believe so. So this is a bigger number than you would get if you continued for. We had to look at a snapshot in time. Right. Absolutely. So Fine. You are correct. But it this would, is you know. too large a number, I think. Okay. I don't get So the question I have is, do we have any idea? I mean, it sounds, it sounds both in quantity, but I think in quality, uh, more negative than it should because these people, the contributions that they would pay in would be minimal. I mean, we might find a way to try and help these people, but I think I don't, a minimum wage worker who's making uh, you know, $11 an hour for le and makes less than $11,000, even on the, under the house pass version where it's all on the employee, would be paying something like less than $50 a year. 1% would be $100, right? Less than $50. Uh, and, and that assumes that the employee's paying the full freight. So uh, I don't know if you can get us any better numbers on that or get us a better picture snapshot of uh, what the complaint is. Can you give me a wage base without those people in it? Without those people in it? Um, to see how big a difference it is. So Doug Farnham Tax, yeah, we could. So our wage base is different than labor's. Uh, but we could back all the W-2s for Social Security numbers under the 10,000 out of our wage data, but we don't have the timing aspect. So um, it's we could back one dimension out of this, but we couldn't back the other dimension out. Well, let's do, okay, yeah. could you try very quickly to the one dimension? 
I don't think many people are going to fail because of the second dimension. Of, you know, the subset for not having everything spread out a little bit over the years. So, uh, and if it makes it easier, we might be able to you know, change that qualification too. So, just if you can get that number, it'd be interesting to, to see it. Joyce, did you have <coughs> other issues in 107 that you feel the clarification changing and improvement or want to flag for us? I think we've covered the two big ones. Okay. Yeah. So I would like to know, do we have, on all the variables on benefits, do, are they all costed out? Let's assume we didn't want to do siblings or grandparents or something like that. We can't no. So we don't have them costed out per ca category that we include. I mean, no, so so I rely on the Institute for Women's Policy Research, Jeff right. Hayes down in D.C., to do all the nitty-gritty modeling of, of how much would benefits be if if, 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 if these were the parameters. Yeah. yeah, and as far as I can tell, he does not have an easy way to say you would save X percent in benefits if you reduce yeah. you know siblings or if you reduce grandparents or whatever. Uh, I think what he thinks about is, are you looking at the, the nuclear family or are you expanding to, to a... To the extent. Yeah, extended family. I, I don't think... So, so what is the nuclear family? So I, I don't even know that he has an exact number for that. He plugs it into his model and out pops it. Parents, kids, children, yeah. grandparents. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of variables in the bills from other states and what the House has sent us. Uh, if we're interested in trying to get the rate down a little bit, it's hard for us to know. Absolutely. We, we could put a menu list. It'd be nice to get an estimate of whether it's worthwhile. I mean, if you get, I don't even know if the house has um, what they have left. Do they have siblings in there? I believe so. Yes. Is yeah. out. Is yeah. out? Siblings is now out. Yeah, siblings came out. Grandparents are in there. <laughs> Uh, grandparents and grandchildren are in there. Siblings came out. Um, I would have to. So parents, children, and grandparents are in. Foster care. Foster yep. children. So family member, child, stepchild or a ward who lives with the employee, a foster child, a spouse, domestic partner, civil union partner, a parent or a parent in law, a grandchild, a grandparent, or someone for whom the employee stands in loco parentis or who stood in loco parentis for the employee. Um, so basically someone standing in place of a parent. Um, now, in this bill, the way it reads right now, for a single event such as a birth, uh -huh. is it correct that all of those people could benefit from this at the same time, the way it technically reads at this point? So. Right, so for leave for a birth, you could have, uh, so. The two parents. Yeah, so you, the two parents. Uh, their and parents and in-laws. And all of their grandparents? No, so uh, the, the two parents and the, uh, I think the grandparents, uh, yeah, so I think I think we're saying the same thing, but it's the two parents and the grandparents of the and child, so the parents of the, sure. the so two the parents. parents of the two parents. Yes. So yeah. So right. Mm -hmm. So you've got yeah. then four, four workers potentially. They're all, they're all they're all qualified eligible, and they could all take leave at the same time for the birth of one. Potentially, we don't have the last year's H one ninety six from last right. biennium as it came out of the house had the grandchild, grandparent piece in there, and it limited grandparents on the birth of a grandchild to taking the leave, only if the the birth parents were not taking leave. So in other words, the the grandparent is going to be standing in place of the parent. But that is not in the bill this year. That is not in the bill this year. It seems to me that there needs to be some practical limits, otherwise you could have, what, 12, 16 people? Well, out six. For a not, not, only that, not only that, I think it's important that we not um, 
that we keep the cost down as best we can and we focus on the main need, not a need that could be duplicative. Maybe we could have some extenuating circumstances. I like, for instance, I like the local parentis thing. I think that's a, a way to deal with extended, uh, uh, an extended, um, extenuating circumstance where the real person needs to is in it capable of is the person mm -hmm. to. Right, and that's well, from you could have a law. In jail that's, you that's just a clarification to Vermont's law. It's already okay. provided under federal law. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that was just added in because there were a lot of questions that came up in the House uh, committee about, well, who's a parent? And uh, so, so because the federal law read? The federal law, um, I can't recite from memory, unfortunately, but the in loco parentis language that we took is taken directly from the federal regulations for the FMLA. And that, given our opiate crisis and parents in jail and all <laughs> sorts of things, you definitely need to. Yeah, so the, the goal with the in loco parentis language was not to create new law, but mm -hmm. just to clarify the existing law uh, by using the language that folks would refer to in the FMLA anyway. Joyce, there's been some discussion, I don't know if you Heard it, but I've certainly heard it. Um, I don't think many states or any state has done this, but is there a um, can you price out the savings if we did a one week waiting period on other than birth? Yes, so I, I have been in contact with the modeler about imposing a one week waiting period. Um, so I'm sorry, what do, you, what do you mean by that? So be, well, it, an unemployment insurance, for instance, there's a period of time where you would have to wait a week and be on your own for a week before you could qualify for benefits. Um, and what, why is that? What's the thinking behind that? It's to save money and administration of really short-term claims. We have it in workers' comp, too, in terms of an injury. You have to be out for three, at least three days before you can make a claim, but you can get money retroactively. But if you're out for a short period of time, you can't qualify. Um, so I don't know if any, I know that states have looked into it. I don't know if they Adopted, but I just want to see if it amounts to the hill of beans in terms of savings. Right, so I have information from the modeler um, that actually came from modeling for the state of Connecticut. They too are considering a paid family leave program, and they have a little bit different structure in that they are looking at 12 weeks for, for all three kinds of leave so parental, sick, and family care. But they um, the modeling shows that if you impose a one-week waiting period before benefits begin, let's see, the costs go down by 26% for family care. So he explained that as saying that um, some people would be taking a day or two or three days to take care of someone who needs chemotherapy, for example, for, for a day and then has to recover for a day. So if you remove all of those short-term periods of leave, uh, you save quite a bit on the family care side. Do we, so, have, do we have sick leave already provided in those circumstances? Is that just for the employee? Uh, so sick leave does cover leave to care for a family member for a short period of time. Five days, actually. It's, right. Yeah, for, if you're working full time, you should, you should be a, getting five days of sick leave minimum per year. Yes. Uh, yeah, it, it pays your wages at 100%, um, and that's from the employer. I should just note there is a one-week waiting period in Washington State, Washington, D.C., and Massachusetts. Um, and Washington State specifically says it's one week for medical leaves, no waiting period for bonding. So. Yeah. That's sort of difficult. You only have five days. You have to take a week before you take a day. That seems silly. No, no. So the, the, this is the earned sick time law we did a few years right, back. Right, right. No, I know. We get five days at 
Yeah, and you Again, did you take that any time right. for sick There's leave? No waiting period on that. That's ludicrous. No, no there is no waiting no period on that. Yeah. The waiting period is on is on the, the on any extended benefit. medical leave right. benefits. Yeah. Yes, the waiting period on a sick days. Okay, so twenty six percent for medical. Leave. Okay, and that's the the cost of benefits, the value of right. benefits, and down eleven percent for own health. Okay. So it might be a little different. For, for Vermont, because we're not Connecticut and we have a slightly different setup, but that gives you an idea. Damien, can you explain, so I was asked this question this morning, um, what constitutes, the, the term is in our law, serious illness, right? For all medical leave, right? Uh-huh. And I know part of that definition requires hospitalization. If you're not hospitalized, to take serious illness leave, what what is required? So uh, a serious illness is defined as an accident, disease, or physical or mental condition that poses an imminent danger of death, requires inpatient care in a hospital, or requires continuing in-home care under the direction of a physician. So any one of those three things can trigger this. So uh, the way that's been interpreted at the federal level, and I have a handout I think I prepared a handout for House Ways and Means on this last year. Yeah, the wording is slightly different under FMLA, but they essentially amount to the same thing. Uh, so for example, chemotherapy, uh, the idea is that you can take intermittent leave for chemotherapy because if you fail to get chemotherapy, that would pose a serious risk of imminent death. Um, and again, uh, the inpatient care in a hospital uh, has been extended to include, for example, inpatient care at a treatment facility uh, if you're recovering from substance abuse disorder. Um, so there, there, there are a number of interpretations around this. I will see if I can find that handout that I prepared. Sure, so that requires the the treating physician to certify that someone needs to be at home with the patient. So if you're taking the leave for to care for a family member, I think this is where people are most concerned about this, is if you're taking the leave to care for a family member who's at home, you, you do need the doctor to say that it's necessary for you to be at home with that family member. This is different than, say, if you're recovering for, from surgery and taking leave for yourself to recover from surgery and the doctor says you need to be at home for yes. two weeks uh, recovering from major back surgery or something like that before you can go back to work or start treatment and so forth and they'll tell you you're not allowed to go back to work for three weeks or whatever it is. So in that latter case, would that person be covered under this paid leave law for their own serious illness? Yes, so they're required, they have in-home care under the direction of a physician there. So they may have a visiting nurse coming periodically. They may have a physical therapist coming periodically. Um, but they're required by the physician to stay at home. Okay, I got that. So now move to a grand, you want to take care of a grandparent who's at home. That grandparent needs a doctor's note. You need the physician to certify that they need in-home care because of a medical condition, uh, an accident, disease, or physical or mental condition that requires you to be there. So this is a little bit different than, for example, if your parent may need some help with bathing and laundry and, and other tasks, which is a common for, for many folks who, I don't think that would qualify. I do think, for example, if your, uh, your grandparent was recovering from a broken hip or something like that, that that could qualify. But just simply aging and needing additional help at home is not going to qualify you for this. Um, and uh, so what I'll do um, just is try to pull together additional information on this for you for tomorrow. 
just to give you that clarity about how this would work. Okay. One other thing I'd be interested in knowing, if we can get it, do we have any estimates on all the categories that the House passed that's covered grandparents, yada, 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 as to what the average length of the leave is? I doubt it, but I will ask. We have those from other states, I think. No, no. not broken out yeah. by like, the type of no, family No, broken leave. out by the type of leave. Yes, we have all it. together, right. family leave. But not versus on who. Right. right. I'm most interested in knowing for the medical leave for the employee. The personal care. The personal oh, care. Oh, oh. How much they're taking in leave time. Oh, sure, we have those. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've handed those out to the committee. Is it on that page? No. So, okay, you see, yeah, not I'll find it. I think it's on the page. Other, but you do, you you do have right there. the employee it's taking time it. off. It's no, I don't it's know. Know. no, it's on the, yeah, I, I can get that easily. Okay. All right, it's, now is a good time for a break. Let's take 10 minutes and we'll <coughs> see if we can plow through workforce development. Hopefully, we might be able to vote. Yeah. That well, that's a lot of appropriation. language that is being worked on. David uh, is coming yeah. back with a a redraft uh, of this, but I'm going to hand this out, so we'll probably be dealing with draft number 6.1. Uh, Do we have, does this include the language? You know, actually, he's going to have another version of that, too, Yeah, yeah. So, so no. Okay. This, this, I don't think this is worth passing out yet. No, it ought to start, so. This is 5.1. Yeah, we're going to have 6.1 so. Okay, great. It's just a few minor changes coming. Okay. So, uh, Change is coming. I met with the uh, vice chair last night and we worked up versions of this um, based upon what we knew know to date. And I'd like to, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll start from the beginning, but I've done the beginning six sections, so I'll do it in rapid fire. I think we're all in agreement on that. Uh, and David will join us for any changes. Um, what we did in section one is we bought into the house's idea of uh, sending Vermont training money or prioritizing Vermont training money for those who receive credentials or work for small business, but instead of uh, their goal where uh, I think the exact numbers we said, 25%, that, right. we said that they should increase over the next two years both of their percentages for about small business funding and funding that results in credentials of value by 10% in each of the two years. We originally had said 5% over five years. Uh, I said our flux would want to go quicker and for a shorter time, so that's what's in here right now. Section two. Uh, we got we got rid of sorry, we got rid of the increased <coughs> subsidy for small business and we just left the program as is is paying fifty percent awards work for small and large businesses and we added uh, remember that Matt Harowitz said he could provide a comparison on how the wages have fared in the Vermont training program versus all other wages in the state, and that's on page eight at the bottom. Uh, the weatherization program, uh, the DOL wanted, well, we talked about not giving them 350,000 to do apprenticeship programs and weatherization and uh, tell them to get that money and I've had brief conversations with Senator Gray in his weatherization bill. Uh, so we'll see how that sugars out. I don't mind the concept of giving money for weatherization training, but I do mind the fact that they're going to get a windfall uh, this year that we should take the money out of the dear money we have 
in this bill. So let them take it out of the new revenue and get it for the purpose of weatherization. And That's so we, the 4.5, remember, the, the million. The, well, the whatever they come up with, I don't think they get 4.5, but. But so a substantial we, amount. Right, we hope. I guess some and remember, we're still way behind on our goal. And that, all, that section also combines weatherization with other key priority areas uh, in terms of getting credentialing in healthcare, construction, manufacturing, child care. So I'm on page 10. Now we've talked about all of, those, all of these before. So we've included all of the weatherization in that construction. One. Well, on section one is the one that deals with what the weatherization industry mm -hmm. uh, and it talks about what the department wanted. This is house pass language in terms of A, B, and C right. as to how we can use the money that they hopefully will get. Right, in another place. So section four on page 11 is just a technical wording change from non-degree to advanced appearance. That's the house language. In terms of section five, post-secondary attainment goal, um, we took pretty much the house language, but instead of uh, a mandate that they get to 70 percent, uh, we set it as a goal on lines 12 through 15 on page 12 by the year 2025. Then we get to uh, adult career. I think this is an important part of the bill. They had the House had a study committee with eight meetings and upwards of 15 people on the committee. We have changed it to a uh, charging the Department of Labor to come up with a game plan and even start implementing it to the extent they can and reporting back to us. The next version you'll see. Uh, Page 17. Well, it's, we had, we just said, you know, the charges on page, oh, it's in there already. Okay. Yeah, we put it. Okay, so we put in the, the stakeholders, Senator Clarkson wanted to list them by name. I thought there was going to be more than this. There, there, there are quite a few. There, are. there will be in the next version. Okay, that's what yeah. I thought. Okay, so, um, but, you know, just like we wanted last year to have the, some would take charge of the rental housing inspection program. Didn't have a leader. A little hot potato. <laughs> yeah. We, we, uh, we're going to be talking about that today in one sentence, right? Yes, we are. Uh, so we, we charge the Department of Labor to pull this together and meet with these stakeholders and report back without having to go through a major study. Committee. On the military, Base thing. Uh, we, well, we, we took out the relocation uh, support. Uh, there's money in here for relocation support, but this is something that they do as a core function, anyhow. I, I don't understand. I don't understand why this section seven, which we Struck oh. had at the top a reader assist military base recruitment. That seems to be maybe that's modified both section seven and eight. Okay. So, so in section seven and eight, we uh, section section eight is the what they label as a pilot program. The whole four drug thing we wanted to go less restrictive, and so we just told them to do it. They didn't want any money. There had been twenty five thousand. Twenty-five thousand out. Um, didn't you want to hear OPR? OPR. I I have not had a chance to look and see if she responded. I emailed Laura <coughs> last night, and let me just see if she responded. Um, okay, so this just tells them to tell the Department of Labor to work with the National Guard and the Agency of Commerce to on marketing and outreach for recruitment events with the military and on-site military bases <coughs> highlights service members separate from the military service. It's not much different what the house did other than it's uh, not restricted to a pilot problem. Whenever they have an opportunity to do this, they should take advantage of that. 
we can, uh, as a general proposition, I just want to say, I'm getting the sense that all these changes at this point are acceptable to the department. Yes, there are a couple of little tweaks with the, the way that you referenced WIOA and um, those you'll see in the next version, but in okay. substance that we're, we're in line. Great. Yep. Great. Uh, workforce training for nurses, this deals with OPR and we work with the lobbyists for the nurses uh, association. Uh, this is a ripe area where we have a lot of need and uh, so targets a specific section and a report on nursing credential. Uh, and David will go over some of these changes. Section 10, we took out the study language on new Americans right. and inserted uh, most of uh, what this pro tem had been looking for in terms of his work in this area it's much more in a directive rather than study and come up with a plan. There are things that are obvious that we can be doing. Now you can go over that, maybe you can go over that section. Section 11 is uh, the department said they didn't need this. They can do this without language and are doing it as needed. Uh, the registry of employers, there was pushback from the corrections department on this uh, to have a, a list out there of employers who want to work with, what do you call them? Alums. The alums yes. of the corrections, corrections department. Mm -hmm. alumni. So that section is struck. But we, yeah, but we do have. Uh, so I asked questions about these dates and I'm looking forward to seeing some answers somewhere. Yeah, we, we do have to do the things. So I'm sorry, I'm moving very fast, but section tw 12 is the one we struck. 12A is workforce training within the corrections department. We'll call about trying to get parole officers and correction officers to be use best practices to help people transitioning out of the corrections into the workforce. Um, the Judiciary Committee looked at this section and proposed language, which I don't think is much different than what the House passed, but I put in the judiciary language. In here, some of the dates you'll see on page 28 and 29 are wrong. Uh, the, uh, well, actually, the date on line 17 of page 28 had read October 10th in the judiciary version. I said, where did that come from? Yeah, it's just it was a bizarre a date. <laughs> so they moved it to October 1st, and the, and the department thinks it's fine for the report to come in a year earlier, as opposed to 2020, so we'll be changing to that 20. no objection to 2019. So I, I, I guess, yeah, and maybe we just call it an update, because they're only going to start their work so late. So my question is, why are they waiting till October to start this work? That is the big question because I, I definitely want that report December of 19. Okay, so I think we should strike the date all together in subsection A. That's one of the yeah. suggestions I had. And okay, they, get rid of that why, and then say, well, they, They'll get start going. when they need to start you yeah. know, to, to get the report done. And if the report is due here, right. that is a huge. I think the date, if I may just tell you where yeah. I think that came just from. Just say who you are. Sure, Sarah Buxton, Department of Labor. They're in the House version of the bill, they wanted the, us to report to the summer, what is it, the Justice, uh, Justice, Oversight. Justice, Justice Oversight, Oversight Committee. in the fall. And I think um, I think this is a holdover from the notion that there should be a fall check-in. Okay. And I don't think there's any opposition to not having a date in there at all. Okay, okay so I, I would, yeah. And the report being Just say the Department of Corrections, yeah. blah, 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 shall work together. Yeah. Right. Right. We were totally puzzled. <laughs> okay. Um, so what on section 13? This is new. Uh, I'm suggesting we add the uh, new worker relocation program in S162 to the bill as passed the Senate by a 28 to 2 vote. Uh, this is the exact same language. I'm not. When I first thought of this, I wasn't so sure 
that they were going to get to 162. It looks like they are, but I'm hearing they're changing it substantially. So I think we should leave this in at this point. Uh, at one point they were saying something that we didn't mean crossover. We had that glitch, but now they're at least not saying that. So I'm concerned about <laughs> that. So I think that's yeah. all the same. So you know, right. it's fine to have it until the last minute. We can have it in a number of places as long as it makes all the lines. <coughs> okay. And then the last, well, the last section of the appropriations discussion but I've also added um, you recall we had uh, Chris Winters in here and we asked uh, I don't know, about was, could have been in finance that could be this is the small business portal and this we inquired board. how it was going and the answer was it's not going no. well and we have no money right. to do anything more so last year they invested um, equivalent of over $100,000 in resources from ADS right. to get this going, and they've made some preliminary steps, but they need more money to keep it going. I was prepared to give them, uh, if I could get it through ways of uh, finance and appropriation, up to $500,000 by raising a $5 fee on all corporate filings, which are very low right now and haven't been raised in a while and also are the primary beneficiaries of the portal. And yesterday, Secretary Sherling, you know, he ran it by the governor, I guess, or whatever, and they said that there's enough work still to be done in the next year that if they press the repeat button on ADS, they would uh, come back with um, uh, a design, scope, cost projections for what they need in the next year, and they would be very open to looking at those fees to keep this program going. They have an initial, they did a report, I don't know if anybody's read it, but they did a report on what they did last year, and they're estimating that to do this portal right, yeah, two to nine million dollars. Uh, they're also saying that they think it will be much closer to the low end, and it could be even less than two million dollars over several years. Um, but as we go through this, I'd like to, uh, I would like to get this out today, but I think we should keep talking to them about is whether they could use more resources this year, and also we would want, we might want to change this language to say we want to see a deliverable in this year. Right. Because they say as they go forward, there are several links that they can get up and running while they're pushing the final product, which is going to be a very large product where you can go to one site and get everything in. So I don't know if anybody has any comments. Rack of land. I want to get rack of land on that portal site. <laughs> get everything. I think this is something the House will like, because they were very much on board. I don't think they know. Oh, I think everybody's been on board with this for a long time. This is one of our... It was about to die, and nobody was telling yep. us. Right. Um, well, Chris did tell us when he was here. When he was asked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, the appropriation section, David, watch out. No, just, no, just <laughs> Cheryl is. Yeah, just, that was a big I'm one. Sorry. That was a I'm big sorry. One. Sorry. Um, you are here. Just that, right? No, no. So you're just looking to see whether or not they need more funding. No, to, this, what to, this, will, this says now is that these. The Agency of Digital Services will lend the Secretary of State a full time employee for the year to, to continue right. to develop this one portal. stop. Oh, okay. So okay. that's like they're giving up s some money yeah. in their department. But there's no money, no more money being appropriated to well, the project. project. There may um, need to be. You find there may, out there may be. I'm sorry, one of the things that I haven't heard back from Chris Winters yet. Is, this was Mike Sherling's idea, and he said he had an email out to Chris Winters and Jim Condos about it, but not had not received an answer. I haven't heard since yesterday anything from them. Whether they think maybe they think maybe they're not on board with Sherling's approach, but we could potentially change that in 
conference, I think we'll have allies in the house with the final product what this looks like. Uh, okay, so the appropriations, you will recall that, and you see it here in the crossed out language. The house had, if you look at page bottom of 35, yeah. bottom of 35, they had a total of 1.725 billion appropriated. Um, and that was appropriated in the budget that this House sent over. They had, as best as I can tell, uh, only uh, $500,000 to ACCD, and they had no money at all for our new worker program, which we had a million and a half uh, in there. Um, most of their money was broken out as 225 for their core functions in marketing and 225 in relocation assistance. What this bill does is uh, it gives them, let me just see this for a second. This is David, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they had, but they have, but for ACCD on page 36, yeah. it looks like the House passed a million to ACCD. Is that right? Uh, I think it was 450,000. And now we have 1.725, which I'm only going to Oh, I'm sorry. What was the total that the House, where was the total that the House budgeted? It was, I think it was 1.595. Right. right. So what does that figure appear? The total. Um, I think around. That's my confusion. At, at, at this point, uh, this monster is a little bit uh, out of control. With you. But um, you, you, looking at the house pass version, it was one. Is this the one we should be looking at now? No, there. I don't know. <laughs> but it looks you like, have the house pass like, there. It looks like I have that. the bottom of page 35, we'll take a pause here to get this right. Uh, section 14 did say that 450000 was. <laughs> Appropriate That's right. So what's what's correct in your? I, I don't. The 500, I think, is a vestige from a previous draft of this bill. Okay. The house passed was 450 thousand to commerce and community development, and it was the breakdown you see here in A and B. It was 225 for economic development, and marketing to for the core plan, and then 225 for relocation assistance. So that was to the Agency of Commerce. The remainder of their bill was appropriations of 1.145 million to the Department of Labor. Okay, so so, so, so we can keep this straight as to where we're going. They had appropriated 450,000 to ACCD. Yes. We're appropriating 1725, 1.5 of which keeps our individual grants intact. And 200 and 25 goes to support services for ACCD. Uh, our bill had 2 million going to ACCD, 1.5 for individuals, 500,000 for support services. Whether you agree with that shift or not, that's what it does. Okay? Uh, at this point. And you'll see the 1.5 on the top of page 37. Now we move to uh, the Department of Labor. They had gotten 1145000 for the various things you see here. 275000 to implement relocation support. 350000 for weatherization, which we talked about before, which we're getting rid of on page on line 8 of page 37. $50,000 to robotics. I'm 
not necessarily against that, but I don't fully understand uh, that it's a small amount for one particular location. And then 470000 to provide general relocation support for grants, et cetera. So essentially what is being suggested here is that the 470000 be cut down to 275 for general support of what they're, I think, of these two things. Are doing pretty much as the portfolio already. Right, to support the relocation systems work and for the, the wet fund work. That's what this says. <coughs> right? So the language, do you want me to weigh in? Yes. Sarah says, can she yes. wait? Yes, please. Sure. So it, well, the language that I understood from a conversation with Allison and from the email with you is with 275 with new money, we would direct it to um, the wet fund activities and to, um, we gave you a, a pointed to a clause for some of the other workforce activities, including support and relocating, um, but not new relocation work. And then for the adult CTE piece, we'll use other um, existing money in the next gen fund and tweak those numbers so that that, that isn't new money. That's just money used to serve the That's next the, yeah. So That's in the next session. Yeah. Okay. So 275 is for the general implementation of all the work. The relocation. Relocation support, support system. system and the wet, wet fund administration and right. all of that. Yeah. I think David got it right. Okay. Maybe David. Does that work, Sarah? That looks, oh, um, 140, I think it's supposed to be I, one I. Oh, actually 141 and not put I, that's fine. That looks great. Nice work. And then the three, thank you, really, David, for doing really that. Incredible. Incredible. Sorry, I'm supposed to send that to you last I ran out of gas. <laughs> that looks good. You're burning on both ends. Well, you? we're all burning out. Too many ends. So I think this works well between new money and current existing money in next gen. Because this is a heavy lift for the um, Department of Labor to be doing both. We're giving them a lot of big tasks. Uh, my mouth is really dry. Right? We're talking so much and fast, but here that's fresh water. Right? I have not. Uh, do people want data to go through some of the changes? Again, we have one type, but we have one change update in this draft. But this we have to like, Otherwise, it looks well. We just consistent with what we have. We did further changing on that date with corrections, David. I don't know if you were in the room or not. When we said bag the date all together at the beginning. Right, and then change the second date of the report on page one. So let's just give them a page on that. 219, December 1st, 219 on page two. I'm working off the <clears throat> So in section 12A, uh, start the work immediately, so no October right. date. No. Right, so just start with the Department of right. Corrections. And then the report would be the, would be due on 2019. Okay. Well, I did skip over the talent pipeline thing, and they came to me and said they don't want to be in the bill anymore. And we did put them in in one place, acknowledging their work and saying the public labor should continue to work with them. And they were fine with that. The striking section is, is on page 29. You mentioned them, it's roughly page 13 in section 6 concerning the, the CTD and the just essentially the importance of work performed by groups. Yeah, so they're having a shell, I think. It just says offers by. Um, so it's my intent, absent further discussion questions, to put this out in about 15 minutes. Uh, if people want to take a break, they can 
take a 10 minute break, uh, or if you want to ask any questions while I have to vote in the legislative round to be able to, to meet something. So. Right. And I just want to clarify with um, OPR that they, on uh, this on base recruitment effort, uh, Sarah, yeah. uh, OPR has this licensing that w we worked on two years last year or the year before where we uh, are uh, honoring the military licensing and, and recruitment things. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Jess, you remember that? Reciprocity. Yes, the reciprocity yep. language. I just didn't know if, if OPR wanted to be included sure. in this, if it was appropriate. And I had emailed Lauren last night, but I haven't heard back from her, so I thought I'd just call her. Sure. And see if she. They're, they're doing the H, uh, the housing bill in House General all morning, the contractor registration. Oh. Uh, she's up there. So that's why she hasn't gotten back. Okay. Um, is it worth calling out or can they just be involved? So we need to bother. Which one is this? We can do it without you calling okay. out. Okay, then let's not bother okay. at this point. Yep. And we can always do it in conference committee. Because sure. guess what? There probably will be a conference committee. The only other thing that you, we never really talked about was a, a tweak to the rules for or the statute around the state board and allowing non-members to serve on committees. Did and we it, ask for that? Was that included somewhere? So in one of the drafts that I sent you some language on, I had a little piece, but you never talked about it in committee. We haven't. That's and true. so um, it, I don't know the protocol for. I don't think it will be. Uh, no, we already changed it. Why? Why is it necessary to have a statutory change? Because in, because the mistake I think the legislature made at one point with the board is in, they took all of the bylaws and just plopped them into statutes. So every time they want to change the bylaws about committee and stuff like that, you have to do statute. both. And so we can go another year. It is not the most critical thing. Um, or if you want to look at it, if you had a brief else. paragraph that you guys. Yeah. Well, we can put it through 162 too. Also, we can see if they want to put it in. And they're working on 162 yes. also at the moment. They're not about to vote that out. So okay, so we can do, do that. that. Is that is that applicable? Sure. Okay, let's do it there. Just given, I think our chair is wanting to move this yes. ASAP. Are we still on the record? Yeah. Yeah. We're on the record. We can go off the record. Oh no, no I was just wondering. Sorry. I mean, I'm happy to do it wherever it's most appropriate. If it's most appropriate here, if you guys have language about that ready to go, we could certainly consider it. Um, I'm hesitant to push the chair. I think the chair is in, in, in a kind of a landing mode. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. As the co-pilot, this is my sense of my pilot, is that we're, <laughs> the, the, the wheels are down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we're coming in. We've got the runway sighted. <laughs> Top air? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Having sat in a cold pilot seat the all the way from Rhode Island to New York City, I level. feel like um, you know what you're doing. <laughs> it was. Um, <laughs> okay, so I need to talk. It, yeah, it, it does not so mirror the federal no. law exactly. This is a some small some small of the um, appointments of members line. mirrors it, mm -hmm. but the activity of the committees. How the chair of one of the committees is that part of it? I think Congress did that on purpose at the time. So okay. I remember that so saying they, they want just they members to be on the committees. Yeah. But so I, you know that's been yep, it, like yep. three years. So I chatted with Tristan a little bit. Um, I mean, I haven't, I haven't actually <laughs> read that federal law now. I feel like I remember that I'm talking about that. Um, no, it's totally fine. I just want to make, again, that's going to call back. I'm just going to make sure it's just Yeah, so they have, on this part is mirrors. I've got to pull that line. Member representation so, um, mirrors federal law. Trash. Other homes would be fine for robots, which sounds like important money for CCB. Start the meetings, the CCB, and quorums, yes. and reimbursement. Um, that's the two. Conflict of interest, I think, is 
very similar to city. It was in the house. It's this part. So we'll be going through more. So I read this as the chance and consultation of the commissioner may assign one or more members to work groups mm -hmm. to carry out the work of the work. And then it says non-members yeah. for discrete purposes yeah. and um, yeah. duration. Yeah. So to us, even though that doesn't say yeah. you can and only assign time. members to the work by pointing out that non-members are for discrete time. purposes and duration, to me that means like you can't assign to a subcommittee on the current pathways, Jane Ramsey, instead of Dan. We could do, we could do um, Heather Michelle, because she has, she's the designated well, under I think the thing with Optima Policy Media Authority. I absolutely yeah. um, yeah. And I remember you talking about like this, but like you said, it's many years. Yeah, I just don't want it to be left out. No. Again, I feel like I don't really you know how much of it seems to be to do this. Because Peter, we are in this and what do you need if you were to get over there? That's okay. Yeah, because we may be able to get over the fact that we can do this. I saw that. I was just going to do that. I'll try to figure it out. And if not, we're going to have a conversation. And the reason being, if I, you know, if I restrict you, I know it's just the nomenclature, but to go from adult to TTG to close second grade to TTG, and the sense that it's like others, there's organizations predicated on that terminology. There's a, and there's different parts in the statute where yeah. it's um, full secondary and adult. So full secondary is, is how Perkins buys and refers to it. Adult is how Perkins refers to it. And in a couple of cases, mm -hmm. I don't not know. in Texas, they're just lying. Mainly that in Texas. That is a good point. I don't think there is a standard way to do it. It's never been very consistent. And for a while it was like, we should not say career and technical anymore. We should only say career and technical. Yeah, career technical. Okay, so my career and technical are career and technical. There is senior senior licenses. So whatever way, I mean, we know what we're going to So whatever way we're going to do. The system is now just set up. There's probably, I know there are other places here. That's for another day. Well, may not be. Maybe that might be a good thing. Oh, that's great. So when we get out, we can see it when we start getting to the community. My day is a good one. Yes, it's appropriate. I'm just saying, it's got to be 10 days. It's got to be 10 days. 10 days from when the budget is set. Extended close to the budget. If the ownership, if the stakeholders decide that actually the state colleges are going to own the document, then it's awkward to have the DOL beginning to destroy it. I'm not going to vote for such a bad end to it. I mean, and that's what I Yeah, we can just take that out. Take out the word 
on line four and begin implementation. Okay. And that, because the ownership what is going to become clear, hopefully, with the work that's going to go on, is who's going to own it, what entity is going to own it. Mm -hmm. So this presumes, in a way, even though we didn't intend it that way, this presumes that DOL is going to own adult ed, which it may not. At the end of the conversation. At the end of this conversation. So I think what we want to do is be, have to be a little less prescriptive on the ownership. And did we get the added groups? Yes. Yep. What, what, what are, are the other added, added groups? So you added, we added Commerce and Community Development, Human ACCD. Services. Yep. Oh, it's here in two. Uh, I don't know if the same one. one. On 17, page 17, draft 5.1. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Hold on. She said that there were. I, I, I pulled from in David that. I, I, I actually yes. don't know if it's in 5.1 or. I it, think it is. 5.1, it is. Yep. That's the one. We have 11 okay. stakeholders. Um, yeah. Stakeholders. Well, yep. Yeah, good. So it is. It's, there you go. Page. You too. Can I can I quickly just ask um as a small point, but sure. uh, terminology in the the directive here to DOL to design page. I'm on the same place, same subsection, page seventeen ish. Right. Um, what are they designing? And here we have uh, a post secondary career and technical education coordinated plan, but then language I received subsequently said an integrated system for post-secondary career in technical education. What do you prefer? Do you want a coordinated plan or a design of an integrated system? Sorry, those are... Uh, yeah, can we do both? Sure. <laughs> a coordinated plan for an integrated system? <laughs> Done. Wait, wait, sorry, David. Yes. David, sorry. Yeah, on the top of 17, where we're talking about their charge... How about an uncoordinated plan? <laughs> <laughs> integrated system. I don't That's see... Them, all I see is a coordinated plan, and, and you're talking about a system that we want it to be more of a system. So the language after you and Sarah met and proposed what's in 6.1 for oh, I haven't funding seen on the back end? The seventy thousand dollars that they can use in part for this work, rather than calling for a coordinated plan, suggested an integrated system. Okay. So that's all I'm asking is to make sure that there's consistency between the money and the charge, and I want to know what you want to get back. So that's some consistency. If we can do both, we'll do both. Well, right. I see sixty thousand on my. It, it is sixty thousand. They are just it's working. It is sixty thousand in the bill. Well, so it's I actually have, 70. You said, you said that I, when we spoke, you said also look at Section 10 for the New American work. Absolutely. Sure. Right. And so it's like plus 10 for the New American work. And it's not new money. No, no, no. So you have $70,000. That's in the next gen money. Okay. So it's not our money. So correct. that's fine if, if you okay. want to Exactly. Say. Yep. Correct. So, yep. Okay. Yeah. This is 6.1. Sorry. <laughs> so are you clear now, David? Clear as mud. No, don't say no, that. Yes, no, I'm completely I am. I'm gonna have, You're going to have a coordinated plan for an integrated system. Okay. A coordinated plan for an integrated, integrated, system. integrated system. Okay, good. And we're going to get rid of and begin implementation. Coordinated plan for an integrated system. And we're going to go we're going to 70 on in a pro in next gen money. The one concern. Um, on the money front, is outside this bill at the moment. Is still that money that was that you and I didn't have a chance to chat about last night that is being discussed vaguely, very vaguely in a pro, which I'd like to clarify because in some ways that belongs here, not in a pro. We don't want them doing our work. And I'm just—I know you're trying to talk in code, but I haven't got here yet. <laughs> uh, it's this language here. Birthday day. Here, it's this language here that I'm concerned about that has been identified um, it, that is in a probe on stuff that's related to this bill and would just blow out of the water our budgeting. Yeah, that's, that's what um, someone came in and talked about, and I said to him, the first time I have to do it himself when the bill gets Okay, I, I didn't hear you say that. Okay, so we're looking for our. I'm a little. Does, it, does, it, does anybody want to speak up from the audience of major glitches that may be in this bill? Sir. Sure. I, I think we've been 
been involved in a round for quite some time, you would have approached us already. So uh, we do have the blessing of the Department of Labor, which I appreciate. Um, we just need our clerk, I mean our assistant, and our fifth member here. And what? And we can vote it. Um, at some point, oh, we'll get a, a copy that has everything in it. Which still the number of moving changes that we discussed here. I think in this one here, there's only the day change. The day. There are some day changes. Where does the 70,000 appear? 37. There are day changes. There's some the language. Bottom, We're going to do 7.18. Okay. Kayla, do we have a vote sheet? We're going to be doing on draft 7.1. Where did no. you say the 70,000 was, Michael? Page, Page 37, 37 at the bottom. And it's not our money, it's next gen. Uh, 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 C-70,000 is in here now. Thank you, Bob. There you go, my dear. Clerk, Madam Clerk. Aside from those two changes, are there any other changes that we've made to this draft that I'm holding? Relative, yes. as I've been sitting here, yes. or no. <laughs> Okay, there, there is there is something I picked up. Version 6.1 is on page 15. There's language where it says appointed by with a question mark in two places. We can't have that. That that'll it's all disappear. Out. That that's that was uh, those were questions raised during committee on who should be on the board a while back. So what if we were to do a draft 7.1? Right. Just, just take out those parenthetic phrases. But I'm isn't it all on crossed out language, page 15? Oh, oh, that's crossed out language. Right. all crossed yeah. out. I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. Isn't it? Yes. Okay. So, and the dates are, are have they been changed in this version or are we still waiting for that change? This is on corrections. The, the, I, I have those. I, I have noted in subsection A that you will not have a date, and then subsection B, it will be December. First of this year, not next year. Correct. Right. So that's right. the only real change. From this no, and then the language in uh, in the a adult ed. Oh right. Yeah. Uh, there's and, and so the, uh, the coordinated and, plan. And did we get all the stakeholders? Yes. We're all set with the stakeholders. Yes. Yes. And there's still some work I have to do with Stephanie and on the budget part, just to realign the seventy thousand dollars. But that was. That's in their part. That's an appropriation. Okay. And thank you. Uh, so we we have an amendment here, a strike all amendment on H five thirty three. Do I have a motion to amend H five thirty three as represented in draft six point one with the two date changes and the coordinated plan change? That will be draft 7.1, correct? Right. So I would move uh, we adopt draft 7.1 of H533. Well, first we have to amend the bill, don't we? Yeah, that's the, my motion to amend it. That okay. we amend so H533 with draft 7.1 of uh, that our amendment is draft 7. Actually, we're, we're, we're asking. The, it's just one motion. I think. Right. Yeah. No, we have to make two motions. We have Do to we? amend it first, and then we have to vote on the amended bill. Well, I think are we? I think we're proposing to the House that we amend their bill. Right. In seven point one, and that's the end of it. Oh, is that the only? Okay, fine. Okay, so we can do that too. So I would move that we amend H five thirty three with uh, Senate Economic Development's draft seven point one. Thank you. Any? Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so I bet the left her vote, I understand? Yes, she did. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure that's kosher, but we'll. Well, we're voting on an amendment that we don't have in our hands anyway, so. Uh, that's, that's kosher. <laughs> yeah. That's kosher. And I think, I think people record their votes afterwards, so it might be. It might be a process where they can record their vote before. Thank you all very much. And so, right the sponsor, this the um, I don't know. Ask, okay. the, uh, ask the governor. Yes. <laughs> ask the